please, congregation, I invite you to turn your Bibles this morning to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings 19, we're continue on in our series, The Life and Ministry of the Prophet Elijah, looking at verses 1 to 18 together this morning. First Kings 19, beginning at verse 1, this is God's holy word. Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done. Now he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. Then he was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord, take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, an angel touched him. And said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. There he came to a cave and lodged in it. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And he said, Go out and stand on the mount before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. And a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. And when Elijah heard it, He wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abba you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel. All the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, you recall from last time that after that great show down on Mount Carmel and after the The people of Israel finally confessed, the Lord, He is God, the Lord, He is God. After all that, the curse had not yet been lifted. Even after that great display of fire from heaven, the heavens were still declaring the judgment of God, and the skies were still proclaiming the heat of God's wrath. For although Israel had confessed the name of the Lord, and although Israel had commanded, had obeyed the command of the Lord, slaughtering the prophets of Baal, she had not yet saw the face of the Lord. She had not yet confessed her sins against the Lord. 
after they slaughtered the 450 prophets of Baal at the brook Kishon, it appeared to be the case, they all simply returned to their homes. And so the promised rain had not yet fallen from the sky. And yet the Lord was gracious, was he? Because what did God do? God provided Israel with an intercessor. The prophet Elijah returned to the top of Mount Carmel, and he earnestly prayed to the Lord that God would forgive Israel's sins and heal their land, that God would, would keep that promise to, to send rain upon the earth. And after the seventh time, the Lord answered. Elijah's servant saw a cloud with the shape of the hand of a man coming out of the sea. And the skies grew dark, and the wind started to blow, and there came a great rain. Not just a, a little rain, not a small rain, but there came a great rain, the Spirit told us, because where sin increased, the grace of God abounded all the more. And that offer of grace, you recall, was not only extended to unfaithful Israel, but that offer of grace was extended also and even to King Ahab. As Elijah ran before Ahab to Jezreel, God was, was giving even to King Ahab the opportunity of a fresh start and a new beginning. In His grace and mercy, God was, was showing Ahab the, the road to repentance, saying that, that the way forward, the way to blessing is the way of, of following my prophet. And so if Ahab would but humble himself before the Lord, if Ahab would but submit himself to the word of the Lord and, and follow God's prophet, then all would, would be well. There need not be that, that tension between prophet and king, but if, but if Ahab will, will follow the prophet, then the prophet will be used in, in service to the king as they could bring about greater reformation in Israel. And that's where the Spirit left things last Sunday. Verse 46 of chapter 18 left us with that hanging question. How is King Ahab going to respond to this great opportunity? Will King Ahab humble himself before the face of God? Or will he harden himself? Will he courageously lead Israel in a new spirit of reformation? Will he finally grow a backbone and stand up to his wicked wife, Jezebel? Or will he be a coward? Well, that's where our passage begins this morning. By answering that question, verse 1, Now Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and how Elijah had killed all the prophets with the sword. Notice how Ahab describes the events that transpired to Jezebel. He doesn't tell her about all that the Lord had done. He doesn't tell her about how the Lord had, had answered by fire, how the Lord had, had commanded the prophets be slain, how the Lord had, had sent rain from heaven. But rather he says, Elijah did it. He killed your prophets. Your problem is, is not with me, it's, it's with him. Sadly, Ahab's heart remains unchanged. And he seems to be more afraid of his wife than he is of the Lord who answers by fire. And Jezebel, we discover, is furious. Verse 2, then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, So may the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. The curse had finally been lifted. The heavens were once again declaring the grace of God, and the skies were once again proclaiming the, the mercy of God as great rain fell from the sky. But Jezebel couldn't care less. Jezebel hardens her heart. You see, congregation, wherever there is an amazing display of God's grace, there is almost always also an amazing display of man's opposition to grace. Grace, you see, cuts through the human race. Grace is that sword that God uses to divide belief from unbelief. God's grace is that, that dividing line of the antithesis. For wherever the, the good news of the gospel of free grace is proclaimed, 
there also the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent is reawakened. That's what we see here as Queen Jezebel lashes out in fury against the prophet of the Lord. The, the slaughtered prophets were her prophets. They are the prophets of her God. And so this message of, of what God has done, really, the, and the message of the rain coming from the skies is, is a message that's, that's hit a very sensitive nerve in her heart. And that's what God's grace does in the heart of every unbeliever. It strikes a, a sensitive nerve. It strikes that that nerve of man's pride and sin and idolatry. And so Jezebel understands that while God's judgment against the prophets of Baal is also a judgment against her and her own hardness of heart and her own idolatry. And so her hatred is flared up and her heart is hardened. And it is in this hardening of Jezebel's heart that the story before us this morning takes on its, its special meaning. You see, the story before us this morning is not merely a, a dramatic episode between two powerful personalities, between Jezebel on the one hand and, and Elijah on the other. Rather, the story before us is another dramatic episode of that conflict between the seed of the woman and, and the seed of the serpent. Through Queen Jezebel, the great dragon, is once again lashing out against the Lord's anointed. Like the great prostitute of Babylon from Revelation 17, wicked Jezebel is, is drunk with the blood of the saints, and she will not rest until every prophet has been wiped out. She will not rest until there is no faithful remnant in Israel. We recognize, congregation, this is the world in which we live today. This is how the world at large responds to the message of God's grace in the Lord Jesus Christ. The world hates it. The world rejects it. The world wants absolutely nothing to do with it. And refusing to acknowledge God and to give Him thanks, as Romans 1 says, the world despises God and despises the church of God. The world takes aim at the church of God. She hates not only the message, but also the messengers, and she seeks to do the church great harm. And so we often feel like Elijah. We have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, but, but so many around us have turned aside. So many churches have, have turned aside, and so we begin to feel we only, we only are left, and the world is seeking to take our life away. Of course, we sing the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ, her Lord. She is his new creation by water and the word. We, we know at least in our minds that, that the church is triumphant in Christ. But we're so often plagued by fighting from within and fears from without with a scornful wonder, right? Men see her sore oppressed by Schisms rent asunder and heresy is distressed. And so oftentimes our, our cry goes up, how long? We begin to wonder if the night of weeping will ever become the morn of song. And so the story and the struggle of 1 Kings 19 is really the story and the struggle of, of the church of Jesus throughout human history. The the storms of this life come our way, and we sometimes struggle to, to hold on. We struggle to believe that, that those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength, as Isaiah 40, 31 tells us. Our faith falters. We buckle under the pressure, and so we, we oftentimes are, are given over to sinful despair. And yet God is gracious, isn't he? God continues to deal so kindly with us. God comes to us in the midst of this struggle. He comes to us in the midst of this great struggle between the, the kingdom of Christ and kingdom of Antichrist. And, and he bids us to be still, to know that, that he is God, that he is right there with us in the, the midst of the struggle. 
That's what we discover here in our passage this morning. Having already unpacked the meaning of Jezebel's frightening plan in verse 2, we now turn our attention to the Lord's faltering prophet in verse 3. Through the fury of Queen Jezebel the Great, dragon has indeed once again reared his ugly head in order to devour her. But how does Elijah respond? Then Elijah was afraid. And he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree, and he asked that he might die, saying, It is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life. I am no better than my father." Elijah has gone rogue. In fear, he has fled from the field of battle. And now he sits under a broom tree in the wilderness as a soldier who has left his post. And he asks the Lord, Lord, relieve me of my duties by relieving me of life itself. You may recall, there was a time when the prophet Jeremiah wanted to do the same thing. Having grown weary of the struggle, he cried out in chapter 9, verse 2 of his prophecy, Oh, that I, I had in the desert a lodging place for travelers, that I might leave this people and go away from them, for they are adulterers, a crowd of unfaithful people. But Jeremiah did not give in to that desire. He did not abandon his post. But this, boys and girls, is what Elijah has done here. Elijah has abandoned his post. He has gone AWOL. He has fled the lines of battle. He's abandoned his people. That remnant flock whom God had entrusted to his care. In fact, it would seem as though he's not given any thought to that people at all. As he speaks as though he is the only one left. Elijah's soul is cast down within him. Elijah has gone from being on top of the world as or on top of Mount Carmel, seeing the, the fire fall from heaven. He's gone from the top of the world to, to being at the end of his rope. He's gone from a sense of great victory to a sense of great defeat. And so much so, he no longer feels life is even worth living anymore. Doesn't Elijah know that God's grace will be triumphant in the end? Doesn't Elijah know that God will always be, be faithful to his promise and to his people? Doesn't Elijah know that, that even wicked Jezebel is, is on the Lord's leash? However severe Jezebel's threat may have been, the, the gods whom she invokes and the gods by whom she swears, they are no gods at all. And so Elijah, of all people, should know that Jezebel is not able to accomplish that which her hatred most desires. She doesn't have the power to, to wipe out the church of Jesus Christ. Who is Jezebel in comparison to the Lord of hosts? But Elijah's faith is faltering. He cries out, it is enough now, O Lord. Take away my life, for I am no better than my father's. And so, congregation, if there was ever a time or a moment in the life of Elijah when, when it becomes totally clear to us that God's people stand in need of another, that time was now. The prophet Elijah, you see, stands in eight. In a long line of foreigners, doesn't he? Of, of foreigners and prophets who are not worthy to untie the the sandals of the feet of the one whom they proclaim and prepare. Elijah's weakness and weariness, you see, point us forward to a greater prophet in whom those words of the prophet Isaiah will finally come to life. He will not grow faint or be discouraged. Elijah's brokenness points us forward to the Lord Jesus Christ who even in his deep agony in the garden of Gethsemane as he pours out his request to God, and as he sweats with, with sweat as though drops of blood, he is not even there given into despair. 
In the midst of the struggle, he does not abandon his post. But instead, he patiently waits for his captors to take him away. Of course, Elijah has done great things. We've seen that. But Elijah, we now see, is not the man. Elijah can't do it in his own strength. And the problem here isn't that Elijah can't do it in his own strength. That's not an issue. But the, the problem is that it seems that, that Elijah has forgotten the fact that that's the very point God has been trying to make all along. This is the very thing which God has been setting out to reveal to Israel ever since Elijah came and said, no rain, no dew except by my word. Why did that word come to Israel? Because after she had built up the walls of Jericho, God had seen that Israel is, is living a life that says, we don't need God. We can do it in our own strength. And God sought to correct that. To say, I'll show you, you can't do it in your own strength. I will shut up the heavens. There'll be no rain or dew except by my word. All along, God was trying to say, you're not strong enough to live in your own strength. You need me. But Elijah seems to have forgotten this very thing. He's forgotten that his help and his strength come from the Lord who made the heavens and the earth. Elijah has forgotten that God's power is made perfect in our weakness. When we are weak, when we know we're weak, that we can't do it on our own, what does Paul say? That is when we are strong. And so instead of fleeing, Elijah should be singing. He should be singing and living in light of the words we sang just a few moments ago. Jehovah is my light and my salvation here. Whom shall my soul affright or, or cause my heart to fear? Elijah's faith is faltering. Ahab's heart is still hard, and so are so many of the hearts of Israel. And now Jezebel has sworn an oath to kill him. And he feels as though he simply cannot go on anymore. It is enough. Take away my life. Shocking words from the mouth of a prophet. Perhaps these shocking words are words that to some of you are all too familiar. Perhaps some of you have, have also known more to say, Lord, I've had enough. Just take me home. I don't think I can go on any longer. I don't, I don't want to face the trials of this life anymore. Elijah's spirit is broken. He's not simply praying for some time off. He's not praying for a break or for a sabbatical. He's praying that he might die. That God would finally take him home. It is enough, Lord. Take away my life. He cries out in unbelief. How does the Lord respond? Here in the midst of Elijah's fear and frustration in the face of of Elijah's faltering faith, the Lord, we discover, is right there with him. And because the Lord is right there with him, Elijah is going to learn that there is indeed stillness in the midst of the struggle. God will do what he has said he will do. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not grow faint. In verses 5 and following, we discover something of the Lord's fatherly presence. Here we discover something of that, that tender love the Father has for all his children dear. Because the Lord doesn't rebuke his prophet. He doesn't reprimand him or get angry with him. Rather, he deals ever so gently with him. And he shows Elijah, and he shows us this morning that death is not the answer. Death is not the solution. And we need to be very clear on that this morning because I recognize that there may perhaps be some of you here who, who maybe think that it is, that death is, a, is the solution. But here we find that 
Death is not the solution. Death is not the remedy to Elijah's despair. But rather, the remedy to Elijah's despair is the provision and presence of the Lord. So, congregation, hear me when I say that if you feel as though you're at the end of your rope this morning, God himself is right there with you. Satan would have you to believe that you're all on your own, but that is simply not true. Psalm 139 says, God hems you in from behind and before, and he lays his hand upon you. Where can you go from his spirit, or where can you flee from his presence? If you ascend to heaven, he is there. If you make your bed in Sheol, even there, he is there. If you make... If you take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there God's hand shall lead you and his right hand shall hold you. The Lord says to the prophet Isaiah, Seek the Lord and while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. The Lord says to the prophet Jeremiah, When you seek me, you will find me. When you seek me with all your heart. God is not absent from Elijah's struggle. He's not absent from your struggle either, no matter what that struggle might be. But he's right there with you, ready to provide for you exactly what you need. He's able to to strengthen your weak knees. He's able to fan into flame your faltering faith. We read in verse 5 that Elijah lay down and slept under a broom tree. God let him sleep. In congregation here, we see that sometimes the rejection of our prayers is actually precisely what we need. God heard Elijah's prayer. It is enough. Take away my life. But God did not grant Elijah's request. See, sometimes the rejection of what we ask for actually contains more grace than giving what we ask for. And that's what we discover here. Elijah receives the grace of not having his request granted. Rather than giving his beloved death, God gives his beloved sleep. Rather than taking away his life, God sustains his life, and behold, an angel touched him and said, Arise and eat. And, and he looked, and behold, there was at his head a, a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water, and he ate and drank and lay down again. God is renewing his prophet's strength. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came again a second time and, and touched him and said, Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. Now, Typically when we come across appearances of this particular angel, this Old Testament angel designated as the angel of the Lord, we're almost always coming across an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, the pre-incarnate Christ. And that's very likely the case here. Christ has come to minister to his faltering prophet. And Christ has given him strength for the journey ahead. Christ has placed his hand upon him to say, I'm right here with you. For 40 days, Elijah travels through the wilderness, but the Lord sustains his life throughout the journey. Just as God had a had a purpose in Israel's wilderness wandering for for 40 years. It would seem that God has a purpose in in Elijah's wandering as well, as he now retraces Israel's steps back to Horeb, otherwise known as Sinai. We know that from where Elijah began in Beersheba, that the journey should have only taken about 10 days, but God leads him through the wilderness, not for 10 days, but, but for 40 days, taking him to the place where Moses met with him for 40 days after leading Israel for roughly 40 years. 
during those days, writes S. G. de Graaf, Elijah must have come to grips with himself. He must have sensed that he had passed a milestone in the struggle without even being aware, but he must have sensed that in the midst of the struggle, he had moved from fighting the Lord's battle to fighting his own. And perhaps in those wilderness wanderings, God was teaching him, this has not been about you, Elijah. This battle is not yours, Elijah. This battle is mine. And just as Israel had to first find the Lord before they could enter Canaan, so too must Elijah find the Lord before he can return to the fields of battle. And so you read in verse 9, there he came to a cave and lodged in it. More literally in the Hebrew, the Spirit says that, that Elijah came to the cave. This is perhaps a way of saying that it's not just that Elijah came to, to any old cave in Sinai, that, but that Elijah perhaps came to the very cave, the very cleft in the rock that that God had appeared to Moses in, in Exodus 33. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant and thrown down your altars and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Elijah is still struggling. He's still despairing. He's still failing to, to see the, the bigger picture of what the Lord is doing in human history in order to accomplish the salvation of his people. We, of course, recognize that Elijah's accusation against Israel is fair. They, they have forsaken God's covenant. They have broken down his altars. They have killed his prophets with the sword. And to be sure, God is certainly going to chastise them for these things that we discover in verses 15 and 16. But here it would seem as though Elijah has given up on these people altogether. And it would seem as though he thinks that God should just do the same. Yes, Elijah has been very jealous for the Lord of hosts. But it would seem as though somewhere along the way he's forgotten who God really is. Of course, God is, is perfectly just, and Elijah appeals to God's justice. They have forsaken your covenant. And in the end, God certainly will execute his justice against all who refuse to repent and turn him in faith, but he is also exceedingly merciful. Bruised reeds he does not break, and faintly burning wicks he does not snuff out. And there are still reeds in Israel. There are still faintly burning wicks in Israel. And God cares about those reeds and those faintly burning wicks. And so despite the fact that Elijah has seemed to have lost sight of who God is and what God is doing, God, we discover, is gracious to remind Elijah of these things. He says in verse 11, Go out and stand before the mount, before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by. A strong wind tore through the mountains and broke the rocks apart. And then there was a great earthquake and then a a great fire. But the Lord was not in any of these things. But after the fire, Elijah heard the sound of a low or a gentle whisper. And that's where God was, in the gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak and went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. God doesn't reveal his sovereignty, his providential care and plan of the universe here and his power to tear through mountains or to shake the earth's foundations, but rather he chooses to Reveal his sovereignty in his stillness through a gentle, quiet whisper. Sometimes, of course, God works in obvious and extraordinary ways. He does do that. Other times, he works silently behind the scenes, as it were. Oftentimes, it's the case that God is doing a great work right under our noses. 
we just don't always see it. Just this morning, another child was given the sign and seal of the covenant. The sign is so simple. Just a little water placed on her head. The, the words that come to them are so routine. I baptize in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. So simple, so routine. Yet in these ordinary means, the simple waters, the God of heaven was speaking. In those waters, God was reminding us of the work that he has done in our own lives. Not so extraordinary, but rather ordinary. Slowly but surely, we have come to know him and love him. It's so ordinary that we sometimes take it for granted, but it's no small thing that, that we're here this morning to worship the Lord when the flesh would have us to run far away from the Lord. That's not a small thing. This is how God often works. God often works in, in the small things. And as Zechariah says, despise not the day of small things. If they, if they bear witness to what God is doing, and this is what the Lord is teaching Elijah here as he reveals himself in a gentle whisper. Once again, Elijah highlights the fact that he's been very jealous. The people have forsaken God and thrown down his altars and killed the prophets. He still says, I only I am, am left. So the Lord answers him in verse 15, Go. Return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria, and Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat of Abel Mahola, you shall anoint to be prophet in your place. And the one who escapes from the sword of Hazael shall Jehu put to death, and the one who escapes the sword of Jehu shall Elisha put to death. Now, in essence, what God is, is saying here is this, Elijah, it's, it's time to get back to work. Go, return on your way. Go, Lord Elijah, return to your post, for I will go before you. I will be with you. I will give you strength. I have not turned a blind eye towards the unfaithfulness of Israel. I know their sins, and I'm going to, to chastise them. And that's what God is going to do through these men that Elijah is called to anoint. He, God's going to use Hazael and Jehu as, as instruments in his own hands to, uh, to accomplish his purposes. God is going to do this because God is still at work. And that's what God is, is pressing upon his prophet here. I'm still at work. I'm still working with this people. And although the remnant may be small, the Lord will yet preserve that faithful remnant for himself. Listen again to what he says in verse 18, yet I will leave 7,000 Israel, a number of completion, seven, right? I will leave 7,000 Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. At the start of our passage, we heard Jezebel make a covenant with her idols to kill. May the gods do to me and more so if if Elijah is not dead by tomorrow, her covenant is so weak and impotent in comparison to God's covenant. For long before she or even Satan himself had ever come into existence, God had already made an everlasting covenant in his son to save the people for himself. And that covenant, that plan of salvation was was set into motion in Genesis 3.15 when God promised that the seed of the woman would crush the seed of the serpent. That covenant was carried forward through Seth after Abel had been killed by the serpent. It was carried through Noah after the flood. The covenant came to fuller expression in the life of Abraham, when God promised that through him and his children, all the nations would one day be blessed. The covenant was ratified again at Sinai through Moses, where God said that he would make his people to be a, a kingdom of priests. That covenant was given royal garments 
with the promise of David when God said, I will establish in your son an everlasting kingdom and his throne shall have no end. And then the fullness of time, that covenant was fulfilled. When Christ finally came into the world and what Isaiah said of him was true. He did not grow faint. He did not become discouraged. He did not grow weary. And as he hung upon the cross, he did not cry out in despair, it is enough. Rather, he cried out in confident victory, it is finished. And that cry secured the promise that God had made all the way back in the garden. So God's promise here in verse 18 that he shall preserve 7,000 for himself who will not bow the knee to Baal is really the the Old Testament equivalent of Christ's promise. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against her. We confess in Article 27 of our Confession of Faith that this church has existed from the beginning of the world and will last until the end of the world as it appears from the fact that Christ is an eternal king who cannot be left without subjects. And this holy church we confess is preserved by God against the rage of the whole world, even though for a time it may appear to be very small in the eyes of men, as though it were snuffed out. For example, during the very dangerous time of Ahab, the Lord preserved for himself 7,000 men who did not bend their knees to Baal. God has been and always will be faithful to this promise. God's people are, are often so stubborn, stubborn in their sin, but here we see that God's grace is more stubborn. His grace is relentless. He does not and will not let go of those whom he has called unto himself. As we confess in the canons of Dort in the fifth head, God's promise cannot fail. The calling according to his purpose cannot be revoked, and the merit of Christ as well as, in, as well as his interceding and preserving cannot be nullified. God is faithful to his promise. And so in the face of the raging world that seeks to undo us and undermine us and destroy us, in the midst of this great struggle between kingdom of darkness and kingdom of light in the midst of our own struggle, We can be still and know that he is God. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your sovereignty you are gracious to bring about stillness in the midst of our struggle. And we thank you, Lord, that you do not leave us or forsake us in the midst of the struggle, but that you are right there with us. That whether we feel as though we're on the top of the world this morning or at the end of our rope, you're there. That we can say with King David, if I ascend to heaven, you are there, and if we make our bed in Sheol, you are there. Father, we thank you that sometimes in your grace, you don't give us the things we ask for because you know what is best for us and you know what we need even better than we do. Father, Satan sometimes tempts to think that death is the solution, that death is the answer. But Lord, remind us again and again that Satan is always a liar. And remind us again that the answer is found in you and in your Son who has drawn near to us to be with us, to be our shepherd forever. Father, we thank you that you work so wonderfully in yet such quiet ways that we often don't always notice. Give us eyes to see these things, Lord, to see that that the midst of this dark world that rages against us, you are still at work. Just as you spoke to Elijah through a gentle whisper so you speak to your church and to the world through the foolishness of preaching. 
and you use that preaching to save some and to bring them to yourself and you preserve them against even the gates of hell. Lord, teach us to rest in this promise to know that we cannot wiggle our way out of your fatherly hand, but that you hold on to us and you keep your promise forever and always in Christ. In whose name we pray, amen.